Welcome, everyone. My name is Murray Rundus. I'm the production manager here at Catholic Family News, and I am honored to be joined today by Dr. David Allen White. Dr. White is the professor emeritus at the U.S. Naval Academy. Uh, he's also well known for some of his works, such as a great biography on Archbishop Lefebvre. He's also the editorial consultant of the great work um, Shakespeare A to Z. It's a, it's a great um, Shakespeare sort of encyclopedia. And he's well known for bringing many converts to the Catholic faith through his his lectures on Catholicism and his teaching on literature. So thank you so much, Dr. White, for joining us. How have you been? I'm doing okay. One one slight correction there. Mm. I never openly uh, directly talked about Catholicism. Mm. But in teaching Shakespeare, it, there's no avoiding it. The only thing I did by way of uh, trying to help the young, I would sit in my office with the door open so that any questions they had from class, they could come in, sit down, and behind me on my bookshelf at the academy in my office was a 1904 Catholic encyclopedia. Mm. So one of the first questions would always be, are you a Catholic? And I'd say, yes. I'd say, I'm a convert. And they'd say, a convert? <laughs> and they, they always, it was interesting. They always had specific questions that had arisen in studying the plays of Shakespeare, mm. which is uh, one reason I have no doubts about that at all, but we'll get to that a little later. Absolutely. And it, that's it's such an amazing thing how just the, the works themselves, just teaching the works themselves can bring out that that truth uh, of the faith and just truths of life in general. But before we begin to talking about the uh, the great bard, I wanted to ask you about your own conversion. As you mentioned, you're a convert. I, I've every time I've um, I've many uh, professors who are uh, very much so influenced by you and were brought to the faith because of you. I know uh, many people as well will just that you're a central part of their conversion story. Where, uh, how did you come to the faith and how did the faith influence your vocation as a teacher of literature? Well, it's very interesting because actually um, the dear woman who gave me my vocation, my eighth and ninth grade English teacher, mm. Uh, actually, I learned after I'd had her in class when I was somewhat older, was a Catholic. Why mm. she wasn't a nun, I don't know. Mm. She was about, oh, close to six feet tall, had the yardstick in her hand all the time, was very, very demanding of the students, but at the same time, um, just a lovely lady and made sure that when we left that classroom, we would know certain things. Mm. Well, at that point, I just read comic books and murder mysteries. And um, she realized I should probably be reading something more than, you know, uh, as, as I call it now, 50 leaks under the sink. <laughs> um, but in any case, uh, the first thing she did was slip me a Jules Verne book, the sequel to that called The Mysterious Island, and I loved it. I thought it was fascinating. And uh, then she slipped me David Copperfield. I couldn't put it down. Mm. And then we spent weeks studying The Merchant of Venice. She made sure we understood the plot, had some sense of how the language was different from what, what we were using in the high school, junior high school cafeteria. <laughs> uh, but she, she paid special attention to me, God bless her. And I remember that Christmas that year, my parents, neither of whom had graduated from college. Uh, my father was a butcher and my mother was a secretary. And uh, they went to her and asked because they said, what do you want for Christmas? And all I said was Shakespeare. I want, I want Shakespeare. 
So they went to her and she said, well, start him out with some of the little individual Folger editions. Mm. And I can remember that Christmas, sitting under the Christmas tree with these well-wrapped little books, trying to see through the paper to figure out what I, I knew what there was in them, but I didn't know which, which of the plays was in them. Mm. And uh, it was very exciting. God bless her. I was, she took an early retirement. Uh, she yes. said there was no administration to back her up any longer, and she quit teaching early, which was a terrible shame. And again, she never mentioned Catholicism in class, mm. ever. But she certainly, in teaching the very best of literature, laid the groundwork for me, and especially especially Shakespeare. Then years later, uh, having been raised very liberal Protestant, I, of course, walked away from it as soon as I got to the university. But I was teaching at Temple University, and I had a student who started challenging me in class. <laughs> and you can call it a teacher's nightmare or a teacher's dream, but he knew much more than I did. It reached the point at times when I would go into class, ask a question and stand and take notes. As wow. He, <laughs> as he would explicate something that was uh, had, had far more depth in it than anything I knew. And then we started having debates it was Philly, so he would show up at class with a whole cheesecake, and sometimes we'd sit in my office half, quite literally half the night, eating cheesecake and arguing about <laughs> uh, the most important things until it finally came down to a battle between Shakespeare and Shaw. And he said, you can't possibly look at them uh, the same. Uh, Shaw's very clever. He wrote a few good plays. Shakespeare was a genius and goes into areas that Shaw couldn't even dream of. And over time, he began to make began to make the case. Now, this would have been 1979. And at that point, he had he had converted. But he just walked into a Catholic church and said, I, I, I want to be a Catholic, and got the answer that many of my students would get for years. Why would you want to do that? Mm. And um, anyway, he persisted, and he ended up catechizing the priest who didn't know much of anything <laughs> about his faith. But he wasn't going to have that happen to me. And God bless him, he went all over the Philadelphia area looking for an older Catholic priest who would give me real catechism. And God rest his soul, good Monsignor Dean at St. Cyril of Alexandria's in East Lansdowne. I would go out there regularly and I got the basics of the faith mm -hmm. from a man who was extraordinary, a, a deep, profound believer and filled with charity. The night he brought me into the church, I remember it was, it was the Feast of St. Nicholas. So not long ago, I had an anniversary for that. And we were walking around outside. It was a rather cool uh, December night in Philly. And he said to me, I have to tell you, you are coming into the church right now at the worst point in its history. Mm -hmm. He said, when I was a young priest, if, if a priest on the other side of the world made a comment, I knew I could agree with it. Now, if a priest six blocks away from this church makes a comment, I've got to check it out first and mm -hmm. make sure he's correct. So I was warned right from the beginning. 
and then um, quite by accident, quite by accident, one morning visiting my folks in Wisconsin during the summer. I did theater every summer. Um, a nice change from the academic world. Mm -hmm. um, in any case, I. I got in the car and thought, well, I'll, I'll go to Mass here. And uh, I somehow drove to the wrong side of town, went to the wrong church from what I, the one I intended to go to, and saw they had a Mass starting. So I thought, well, I might as well go here. I wandered in, and a little Irish priest, old guy, came out and started talking in a foreign language. <laughs> and I caught on, this is Latin. This must be that old mass. And that's all it took. I was <laughs> I was hooked and have been hooked ever since. Mm -hmm. Well, it's such an amazing story because it shows how even during these terrible times that we have in the church, God still plucks uh, plucks oh, people absolutely. out. It's it's a, it's absolutely. amazing. It's yeah. a matter, it's providential. I mean, I, I look back now. Now I, I'm an I'm an old man now. But I look back, and it's interesting. The last four Shakespeare plays have much to do with providential design. Mm. And it's the mystery that we still have free will and can make our free choices. But somehow God has directed us, and he knows what we're going to choose. Uh, I once asked... Uh, the question of a, of a very holy bishop, uh, Aquinas says that, uh, that both providence and free will exist simultaneously. I said, how is that possible? And he said, that's, that's one of those mysteries that we will not discover on this side of the veil. Mm -hmm. So, uh, one, one hopes to make it to the other side where those fascinating questions will will be answered. But yeah, people are led. People are still led. And mm -hmm. in, in if, if they are sincere, um, have goodwill, it happens. It mm -hmm. happens. So. Absolutely. And you mentioned the, the great the mysteries of the faith that can sort of be shown through, especially in Shakespeare, but really in all kinds of literature. I want to turn uh, to Shakespeare and really where this begins. And I have to ask you, it, it's sort of a sort of an annoying thing because every time I, you know, Shakespeare gets brought up, it's sort of a, um, a, a almost a pseudo academic thing that people do to say, well, Shakespeare didn't really write those plays. I remember one of the first times I came to contact with Shakespeare was somebody I was in Hollywood at the time. Someone was saying, "Well, actually, Shakespeare didn't write that. If you look at it, uh, his his he was a very uh, it's a very feminist writer, and it's very obvious that it was a woman. It was likely Queen Elizabeth. So, how do we even know that this man wrote these plays? Could you could you give us a a view over that drama? Well, the first thing is the plays themselves, mm -hmm. and it's it's a reason why right now they are being hideously misread. Uh, in fact, it's reached the point they are trying to stamp out Shakespeare studies even in English departments. Um, there was a survey recently, I don't have the number, I, I think the numbers are close, but I, I, can't, I can't swear to them, where 54 of the leading universities, so-called. I'd love to see that list, but that's a that's another <laughs> that's another subject. Anyway, of the 54 leading universities in the English literature department, only four to six require a Shakespeare course from their graduates, from their Goodness majors. Gracious. It's mm. unbelievable. The reason I think they are trying to get rid of him and they're doing an amazing job is he embodies Western civilization. He embodies Catholic values. And is they're destroying everything else and bringing it to ruin 
they know that they need to knock down this statue and uh, just get rid of him. Or as I put it, to Chaucerize him. Nobody reads Chaucer anymore, whom I love, absolutely love. But uh, it's become a non-subject. You, you, meanwhile, um, at the Naval Academy, I, I, I just learned they're searching to hire a f new faculty member in sexual and gender studies. Of course, right, of course. Yeah, well, yes. that's, that's what you need in the military, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Scare the enemy to death. Right. <laughs> that's, oh. <laughs> that's, that's, that's crazy. But so, I mean, there's an assault on him. Mm -hmm. uh, the productions are terrible, terrible. I was lucky again when um, I was, I had just started high school. And the great British director, Tyrone Guthrie, opened his theater in Minneapolis. And I saw his productions of Hamlet with Jessica Tandy and George Grizzard. I saw his Henry V, just spectacular production. He brought in Hume Cronin to play Richard III. I, mm -hmm. I mean, I got to see great productions of it. And the irony is Guthrie, in a way, unleashed some of the modernization, modern settings. But there had to be a direct correlation between the play and the time in which he was setting it. It wasn't just whimsical. It was because there were things to be learned by a slightly different background or vantage point. Mm. So, uh, but it, but they're doing their best to get rid of him. And one way they're doing it is, you know, he was Elizabeth the first. No, he mm. wasn't. He was Francis of Bacon. No, no, no. He was the you know Earl of Oxford. No, he was the Earl of Derby. No, he was the Earl of Richmond. No, he was Christopher Marlowe. I'm not joking. There are somewhere now between eight and ten candidates. Mm which shows they're grasping at straws. Uh, the current favorite is, is the Earl of Oxford, yeah. who, who printed poems publicly under his own name that are pretty mediocre. Mm. Now, the response of the Oxfordians is, no, they're just as good. They're fine poems. Uh, my response is, well, then why aren't they in every anthology? And why is, find me anybody out there who can quote lines from one of the Earl of Oxford. <laughs> now, I, and and I'll, a little later, I'll talk about the fact we know a great deal about the man himself. And I want to look at a couple of things that tend to be ignored, that, mm -hmm. that point us towards the truth, which can always be found if you go looking for it. Mm -hmm. But I've got to tell you, this is a uh, uh, this is a true story. This was many years ago, and Father Gruner, God rest his soul, yeah, may he rest in peace, invited me up to Buffalo to do one of the TV shows with him, and so I flew up from. Uh, Baltimore, where the airport was, to Buffalo, <laughs> and got a taxi. Father just said, "Just jump in a taxi and come over." And you know, uh, so got in the taxi, and I'm chatting with the very nice taxi driver. I mean, a delightful guy. But um, if he if he'd read any books that year, I would have been surprised. But he was. He was a man earning a living. We know what that could be like. Anyway, he started asking me, well, what do you do? I said, oh, well, I teach. Oh, where do you teach? At the Naval Academy. Oh, the Naval Academy. What do you teach at the Naval Academy? I said, Shakespeare. And the response was, he didn't write those plays, did he? <laughs> a taxi driver in a car. <laughs> That's what it's come to. Mm. It's, it's just, it took my breath away. I, mm. Yeah. Yeah. What can you say? It's yeah, it's spread so far and you're right. It clouds 
basically all of Shakespeare's scholarship now. It's either that, or you have you know embarrassing things talking about, well, he was actually a feminist, he was actually a queer theorist, or or whatever. I want to ask you about one objection. I, I hope you could answer it for the audience, because you I've heard this oftentimes, and you could say it's, a, I, I guess, a bit more of a serious objection, which is, well, look, um, he didn't have uh, a great education, and if you do oh, read oh. the plays, yes. yeah, if you if you read the plays, well, it couldn't have been written by him. He had an eighth grade education. What would you say to that sort of objection? Um, I have a very, <laughs> I have a very simple answer to that. Um, education can be constructive or destructive. Mm -hmm. um, I know of a very bright young student who went to Yale. She was taking a Shakespeare course at Yale and was told that the real heroine in Othello is not Desdemona, but Amelia the Maid, who gives voice to the feminist point of view. Wow. Goodness. He was so all-inclusive. He was creating living human beings, okay? Mm. So that the character is in contrast to Desdemona. We have two different kinds of women there. It's mm. very easy to pick one of them and say, that's Shakespeare's point of view. There, there were, needless to say, uh, some of his own compatriots who joked about the fact that, well, he didn't, have, you know, he didn't go to Oxford or Cambridge. But we do know this. Stratford was very much a, a uh, Catholic community. And they would have had a Catholic school. We know that the schoolmaster there was devout. And interestingly enough, out of this little class of the few students, you not only produced a Shakespeare, but one of the leading legal minds in London at mm. the same time. And that says to me, um, he was getting he was getting what he needed so he could do everything that he was capable of doing. Uh, somebody could say to me, in certain ways, I could have stopped my education after ninth grade and still have had the fascination um, with, with the subject. And be, well, he never went to college. Well, I did go to college, and it was a rat's nest back when I was in it. I was there in the 60s. Heaven forbid. I mean, it, it's a miracle I escaped with my life. <laughs> but, the, <laughs> but that was part of what eventually got me into the church. Mm, um, absolutely. But, but, but one other thing I would say, we don't know how God is going to distribute his gifts or what the mm -hmm. gifts are going to be. Um, we have an aversion now to the great, the greatest geniuses that have been produced. And just as, um, well, I'll mention it again later, but um, a, f a friendly adversary of Shakespeare's, good friends, um, but, but very different views, uh, at one time was told by someone who had seen Shakespeare write, he never blotted out a line, which is mm -hmm. staggering. To be or not to be, that is a question. Whether it is uh, uh, noble, nobler in the mind, to suffer the sl slings and arrows, that's good, slings mm -hmm. and arrows, outrageous arches, or to take arms against a sea of troubles of my opposing hand. No, mm -hmm. That's not bad, okay? <laughs> um, and, and the great Ben Johnson response was Woody had blotted a thousand. Once he started writing, you couldn't stop him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wow. or, but it's very similar to Michelangelo, mm -hmm. uh, who would go and stare into the quarry sometimes for days on end and then say, 
I want that chunk of marble to go back to my studio. And then someone would say to him, what, what, why, why that chunk of marble? And he'd say, mm-hmm. because the statue's in there and I just have to let it out. Mm-hmm. Or my other favorite example, uh, just a natural genius. So Mozart's playing Skittles with friends one day, a mm-hmm. uh, sort of lawn bowling. Okay, and it's a nice day, and they're outside, and they're playing Skittles. And all of a sudden, he grabs a, a pen and some paper. I don't know where the pen came from, but anyway, and starts writing. And they say, hey, hey, Wolfgang, are you going to play or what? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And he puts that down. And he goes <laughs> and takes his turn and goes running back, and it's copying stuff down. And at the end... He had written the great clarinet trio and won the game of Skittles. <laughs> I, and he never went to a university. No, right. He had his father, he, he was homeschooled. He had his mm-hmm. father teaching him. And then he met some other very good composers um, who, uh, who taught him much. Yeah. It's fascinating because, you know, it's like you said, God gives so many gifts to people throughout, throughout time. And I want to, I want to talk a bit about um, Shakespeare, Shakespeare and how he really does represent the Catholic mind and sort of the, the remnants of the medieval mind. There was a quote from um, Sir Thomas Carlyle who talked about how uh, Dante and Shakespeare really do represent a different era. It's right before the mod. It's uh, talking about um, this this medieval uh, Catholic Europe and how Shakespeare is sort of a a representative that moves us into the modern age. So to answer a um a question that you see from from many people, because uh, many people will ask, well. Okay, even before I read anything by Shakespeare, was he a Catholic? You know, many people will say, is for some people that legitimizes the work or not. So, do we have any evidence from the plays themselves, any of his other works, and the circumstantial evidence as well that leads you, uh, what, what leads you to think that this man was likely a Catholic? Oh boy, there's a, there actually is quite a bit of stuff. Um, mm-hmm. The Stratford area itself was was uh, a catholic area but let me say one thing before I, I get into some other specifics more general comment mm-hmm. uh, shakespeare shakespeare lived at that tur- at a turning point in human history yeah it, there was an enormous shift that took place it's the reason why, for him, the great literary form was the drama. Drama is conflict. At the core of the greatest dramas, there is conflict. And to be fair to two sides in a conflict, or understand them, or be able to set down on the stage the battle going on between them is a remarkable ability, and that was one of his gifts. Mm-hmm. So that um, it was it was T. S. Eliot who said, "Shakespeare and Dante divide the world between them. There is no third." And what he mm-hmm. meant by that, Dante comes out of the Middle Ages with this incredibly cohesive, coherent religious view that is being torn apart in Shakespeare's time. But Shakespeare represents all of human drama, all the emotions we feel, the troubles, the joy. Well, let me put it this way. I divide his works into three periods. First of all, the early, the comedies. Comedies come first, followed by the great tragedies, followed by, um, and they're referred to as the glorious romances. We have the mysteries of the rosary in following his career. The joyful Mm -hmm. mysteries, the joyful plays, the sorrowful mysteries, 
the sorrowful plays and those romances that seem to be tragic have been touched by tragic that somehow miraculously are transformed into great glory by the end and are completely uplifting. Mm -hmm. So I, in a way, you almost have to take the work, it's the works themselves. But at the same time, he wasn't immune from it. The simple fact of the matter is uh, he himself, I, I'm not one of those who believes in the biographical, um, that, that all he is was setting down what was happening to him. Again, imagination can do more than that. Mm -hmm. But it's pretty clear he was going through a crisis when he wrote Hamlet. And it's not accidental that Hamlet in the play is a student at Wittenberg. Mm. Um, rather well known for not just the questions it raised, but this notion of doubt everything and the old world is, is not what they say it is and needs to be torn apart and put together. I mean, it's, it's right there. Uh, the, the only others, there, there are three figures in Shakespeare I take sort of biographically. The last Prospero uh, in The Tempest, where Prospero forgives his brother and those who have wronged him, um, leaves his magic island and talks about drowning his book, okay? Um, and indeed, the last lines of those, of, of the epilogue, Prospero, the actor, Shakespeare, which one is it, looks at the audience and says, um, uh, and my ending is despair, unless I be relieved by prayer, mm -hmm. which pierces so that it assaults mercy itself and frees all faults as you from crimes would pardon be. Let your indulgence set me free. Indulgence, indulgence at that yeah. moment, and that's in the last line we, you know, of, mm. of the one complete play he wrote before he left London. I mean, fireworks, excuse <laughs> me, accidental, no. Mm -hmm. No. And then the other one that I find wonderful is Nick Bottom the Weaver, who gets mm. the ass's head in Midsummer Night's Dream. And I'm convinced this is a guy from Stratford um, who had a love of theater. And here's, here's Providence again. The medieval mystery plays were always done on Corpus Christi Day throughout all of England, okay? The only place they but they started dying out one at a time. The only place they were still done was in Coventry, close to Stratford. And we do know Shakespeare's father was a devout Catholic. He paid the fine rather than go to the new mass. Mm. I'm, not, I'm not making these words up. He wouldn't go to the new mass. So he would have taken the family every year to see the parade of these mini dramas on the carts as they rolled through the streets of Coventry. And we can imagine the young man's eyes wide open, staring at these plays, the Noah play, the Abraham and Isaac play, and just having them go deep inside him. Um, and then suddenly he gets to London, he has some success, but in one year he writes, Richard II, Romeo and Juliet, and A Midsummer Night's Dream, and probably mm -hmm. 50 some sonnets. And um, it's bottom waking up after, 
he's the only one who ever sees the fairies. <laughs> and not only that, the queen of the fairies has fallen in love with him. Mm. And he says, you know, I, I, I have had this most strange dream. <laughs> I dreamt that, you know. And that has to be part of what he felt. Mm. Because he was, he, he was creating masterpieces and must have had some sense, oh, this is pretty good. <laughs> and he made a career out of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Um, it's, it's much more complex. People come up with simple answers to the most complicated and mysterious of events or occasions. Or, but then again, we live in a time where very few people can think above their belt. Yeah, true. <laughs> it's it's yeah. just pathetic. That's we're just obsessed with it. Hmm. It's, it's absolute. Now, not that he didn't know that. I mean, it's pretty clear. His first, his his beloved daughter Susanna, was born six months after he was married, hmm. um, and you know, Anne Hathaway got him. She was six years older than he was. <laughs> I think it's in Twelfth Night, one of the characters says, let a man take a wife younger than himself. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I guess maybe there was a little but but the interesting thing is he and and the to be Mrs. Shakespeare when they were married did it in private. An old old priest that lived near Stratford. Mm -hmm. Who was known to be devout and had nothing to do with the new the new religion, but was known for healing animals, especially birds. But they went and saw him, and he was the one that married them. Fascinating. Yeah. Fascinating. And am I correct in thinking, if if I recall, the he was a suspected um, Catholic. I, I believe his name was John Frith. Yeah, um, but yeah. He, yeah he, he did conduct their their wedding. That's it. Would yes. seem that they had a, a Catholic marriage then, they or, had it, a Catholic at least marriage. possible. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's fascinating. Yeah, Is there it, any other circum circumstantial evidence that you, uh, you'd like to bring up? Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. There. Um, there's one of the mystery. One of the mysteries has been shortly before he retired mm. and went back to Stratford to live, and he was well off. He'd made a he'd made a very successful career. He bought. Um, it's called the Black Friars Gatehouse. Mm close to the Black Friars Theater, where his last plays were performed. Um, they had wonderful, it was indoors, wonderful machinery. So they were operating in the Globe and the Black Friars. And nobody can quite figure out since he was leaving London, why he chose at that point to buy a property and it was discovered, I, 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 I'm not sure exactly how long ago, it was discovered a while ago, uh, maybe 20, 30 years, that the Black Friars Gatehouse was a hiding place for priests where they could say mass. Fascinating. Yeah. And I, I, credit where credit's due, the, the one who started this was a very bright, very sweet man named Father Peter Millward. Yes, yes. Yeah, Father Millward, I, I never met him. I emailed with him a lot back and forth. But he spent his entire teaching career in Japan and turned out, you know, who knows how many Japanese students and introduced them to... Uh, to Shakespeare. And I have to say, since uh, one of our favorite uh, adventures now is, I'll put it politely, being critical of the Jesuits. Yeah. Father Millward was a Jesuit yeah. who actually did the best of the sort of work 
the Jesuits used to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, God rest his soul, good man. And in our own time, Joseph Pierce has put Absolutely. out some some uh, very some very good work about on the on Shakespeare as Catholic. I disagree with him in his reading of some of the plays, but that's part of the fun of Shakespeare studies, <laughs> right? Yeah, and for but, our audience, but in, ter but in terms of his overall view of Shakespeare as, as mm -hmm. Catholic, he, he well, and his reading of many of the plays is very yeah. good. So. Yeah. yeah, there's still some good scholarship out there, luckily. Uh, for, or for our audience at home, I believe Millward's book, um, I have it here. It's I, I think it's oh. called Shakespeare's Religious Background. I think it's still yeah. in print, so yeah. uh, definitely go check that out. Um, I wanted to mention, to, I wanted to ask you about another s piece of scholarship. It's, it's come out within the past 20 years. Um, I, it's, I, have, I have it printed out here. It was started about from uh, John Finnis and Patrick oh. Martin, I think their name. Yes. Oh, boy. And, Yes. And it's, um, Are you ready for this? Yes, this is a fact. This is, I think, one of the most fascinating parts of, of Shakespeare. It's been one of the greatest revelations that come has come out in recent the time. And it's greatest, about the mm -hmm. greatest revelation in my lifetime. It's it's wonderful. Could you tell our audience about it? What yes. what's so great about this revelation? Um the the poem they are writing about is called The Phoenix and Turtle. Mm -hmm. published in 1601 in this little individual book of love poems about the depth and the glory of love. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm proud to say that for 400 plus years, well, now it's, it's getting up there, well beyond 400 plus years, mm -hmm. Nobody, Shakespeare contributed a poem, and we know it. He, he signed it. It's, you know, he was popular enough. They, they knew they'd sell some copies, and he wrote a poem, The Phoenix and Turtle. I am delighted to say that these two men who finally unlocked the poem, which had remained a total mystery for centuries were not literary scholars. <laughs> they were two men. Uh, John, John Finnis is a philosopher, has taught at Oxford. Um, Patrick Martin taught, I think, at the University of Notre Dame. Anyway, in, in one of the schools in Notre Dame, he teaches law and particularly oil contract law of some oh, wow. kind. <laughs> and these two men just got fascinated and went, went exploring the article. I can give you the date. The article is in the Times Literary Supplement. April 18th. 2003. Mm. It's the single most important piece of scholarship. What they, well, it is just, they go through it line by line and build their case and prove it completely. And that is the poem was written about an English martyr named Anne Lyne who on Candlemas Day, February 2nd, 1603, or is it 1601? 16, ah, I, I see, 1601, 1601, <laughs> on Candlemas Day. She was running again, a, they called them priest holes, where priests could go and hide out, be taken care of, say mass, you know, sort of, you know, and because the the mass was forbidden everywhere. I think it was an early form of COVID. No, I, that's, <laughs> no that's a cheap joke, but uh, um, but it was forbidden. 
Uh, mm. you know, the new mass had come in. The old mass was, this all sounds remarkably familiar. Yeah, it's familiar, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, <laughs> she was on Cayenne Mass Day. Um, the goons invaded. They found out where she was. They invaded the place. She saw to it the priest escaped. She was arrested. And she they'd been looking for her. She'd been doing this for ages. She had a chaste marriage. She had converted. Her husband had converted. He had been arrested years earlier and thrown out of the country into exile and went to Flanders. They never saw each other again. They never had children. You can, and it, all of this begins in the poem. You can find where, just if you want a quick look at it. Um, she was hanged at Tyburn on February 27th, 1601. And those who were there said she could barely walk to the gallows her legs were like rope. Mm -hmm. um, but she had stood up before the court and said, uh, rather, rather than renounce the fact that I hid a priest, would I have been able to hide a thousand? Well, that was it. And mm -hmm. they killed her. Immediately, uh, Father Garnett, who was hidden in, uh, uh, again, a Jesuit, hidden in England, sent word to Rome of the remarkable courage of this woman, what she had done. And she'd just been thrown basically in a, in a pit. And they got the remains out and had a very, all we know is, a very private ceremony for her. It is known that William Byrd, the greatest composer of the age, obviously wrote a motet to be sung at that service, but we don't know which one it was. And then I am sure they asked Shakespeare to write a poem in her memory, and he wrote The Phoenix and Turtle. And it is a lovely and beautiful poem. But what these two gentlemen did was they unlocked every single line of it. I'll just give you one thing. And to this day, when I, when I read it, it breaks my heart. The beginning, of the first, about the first half of the poem is in four-line stanzas. Well, nobody understood why suddenly... When the, the, it begins, let the birds of loudest lay um, in the sole Arabian tree, herald sad. Uh, um, it's, so it's a solemn occasion. It's, it's a, one of those bird poems, but of course the pun on bird, who, mm -hmm. who was, um, very bold and open in his public Catholicism, unlike Shakespeare, who was withdrawn, not as public, just a different kind of personality. Um, so, and and uh, beloved by the queen. He, suddenly, when the birds go to the urn to pray, the four-line stanza goes down to three lines. And these gentlemen point out the obvious is what has happened. A line is missing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a... Yeah, it gives me chills. Yeah, it's amazing. It's just, it, overwhel it just overwhelms you. Mm -hmm. But in any case, um, she was officially sainted in 1970 and is now uh, listed among the great Catholic martyrs. By the way, I, I don't know if you've ever been 
to the place where Tyburn Tree stood in I've London. Known. Um, it's now in a little traffic triangle, cars zooming by. Uh, my friend and I, when we were visiting, <laughs> I took our lives in our hands and ran across the roadway. <laughs> we got there and were able to kneel down and uh, pray a rosary where all those martyrs were killed. Mm. In fact, the priest she helped escape was caught shortly thereafter, and he was martyred. But of course, since he was um, since since he was a man, he was uh, drawn and hanged, drawn and quartered, mm. which is so again. Something you don't want to really think about, but God sends the graces needed at moments like that. Yeah. And it shows, you know, a lot of us complain nowadays about how difficult the situation is in the church, but I think this is a testament to how these great defenders of the faith went through so much trouble just to protect their faith. So it should be a source of inspiration. And for those, again, wondering, because I, I think this is the, the sort of um, the nail in the coffin, if you will, to talk about to talk about Shakespeare's Catholicism. That is, the article is Another Turn for the Turtle, Shakespeare's Intercession for Love's Martyr. And as you mentioned, it's a Times Literary Supplement on April 18th, 2003. It's fascinating. Um, yeah. I wanted to ask you another thing. It's about Shakespeare. Shakespeare's relevance to the to the modern world, um, because we've talked about how he is a um, uh, speaking a transition for you know going uh, from the, the medieval mind yeah. to sort of the modern world. I want you know. There's this idea that each century has a play. You know, it's to often said that the 19th century it was Hamlet. Uh, the 20th century there's a there's a unique fascination with King Lear. Uh, and you've seen, we've seen that with all of the, the dark productions that I think you can say is a representation of, you know, of course the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany and, and the rest. What do you think is, and maybe, uh, might be in the future, the 21st century's play? What do you imagine that that will be? <sighs> my, my guess would be a little-known play called Cymbeline, hmm. one of the last four romances. There, there is a book out just called, in fact, the title of the book is Anne Line by, by a young Brit. And he goes, he goes through the play, talks briefly about the phoenix and turtle, but then says, Shakespeare creates the heroine of that play, one of his most beloved heroines, um, Imogen. And she is modeled, he said, he claims on Anne Lyme, mm -hmm. and that uh, Shakespeare pay, played, paid two tributes to her one in the phoenix and turtle and the other in his his creation of imogen but because i'll tell you the most difficult thing to do in a in a drama a movie a novel is to create a memorable good woman mm. a lady may Beth, a Cleopatra, I mean, they're, what, <laughs> they're very memorable. But to have one of that stature, sort of that enormity, that radiates goodness. It, and the, I hate giving away the ending, but I'll just say, there's a battle between England and Rome, and it ends with reconciliation and England submitting to Rome once again, but it's through a shared vision, and it's because of the triumph of the good woman. Hmm. And right there I see if someone will finally do the actual consecration hmm. of Russia to the Virgin, 
which it's been so easy to ignore. I'll do it my way. Yeah. You know, it matters what Frank Sinatra singing about it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it. It's just, it's ridiculous. But World War II could have been avoided, all subsequent wars avoided, and they will not do it. However, um, she herself said, in the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph. Rome, uh, Russia will be consecrated to my Immaculate Heart. And a period, though it will be late, mm -hmm. and a period of peace will be granted to mankind. I believe it. Yeah. I believe it. So oddly, um, you're quite right. For the past ooh, 200 plus years, it's been the tragedies that have dominated. Mm -hmm. And people really don't know the glorious uh, mysteries. Mm -hmm. the, um, the Winter's Tale is just a remarkable play. Mm -hmm. The greatest production of The Winter's Tale I ever saw, and again, I don't want to give away an ending. Let's just say <laughs> there's a surprise ending. But um, I saw it in Minneapolis, on a de December night when it was 20 below zero outside. I mean, it was a winter's tale. And uh, when that moment came, shocking moment, because most of the audience didn't know the play, there was a gasp, and the audience <laughs> lifted about three feet out of their, out of their seats. Uh, former student of mine, has written a, a little book on uh, on the Winter's Tale called uh, A Tale Told Softly. Mm -hmm. And it's it's still available. I mean, it's uh, it just, uh, boy, Robert Morrison. And uh, he's, he's, he's done some very, he, he picked at it for years mm -hmm. as really, and here's another bit of evidence about the Catholicism. Um, it was a seminar on the romances, one of the last ones I did before I escaped the Naval Academy. And they had to do a seminar paper and he didn't know what to write on. He came to me and said, I don't, I said, I just don't know what to write on. I said, well, is there a character in the play that stands out? Oh yeah. yeah. Well, just go read to see what you can find out about the character. He turns in this paper and he didn't make this up, but the, the figure that helps everything turn out in the end is named Camillo. Hmm. So he said to himself, well, let me see if there are any famous Camillos. Well, the most notable was Pope Paul V, the reigning Pope when Shakespeare wrote The Winter's Tale. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then he started going through and Camillo says things such as, uh, I have the keys to open all the portals. I mean, and all of a sudden it's like, whoa. <laughs> Everything makes sense. Goodness gracious. Yeah. 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 Wow. Yeah. Yeah. There's so it's many pieces like that. It's amazing. Just astonishing. Just yeah. astonishing. But, uh, but again, that's part of the fun of, uh, of teaching. Mm -hmm. And just, you see, you see what these students can come up with. And it's, uh, it's a great and wonderful thing. Let me, I don't want to hold you here. For oh, no, you're fine. You're fine. <laughs> let, me, let me do one other thing. This I really want to do. And it's, um, for me, the major proof that Shakespeare wrote the plays and was Catholic. And it's not often mentioned. Mm. There were, I mean, there were great writers at that time. Some of them just wrote one great play. Others had sort of minor careers and did interesting mm -hmm. stuff. 
But the other really great writer in terms of the theater and poetry was Ben Johnson. Mm -hmm. And we have one, one uh, account of Shakespeare and Johnson in the tavern after the, a performance. At the end of every performance, all actors and theater people go to the bar. <laughs> you need it. You can, so you can settle <laughs> down there for all that intensity. So anyway, someone that was there and saw them and wrote down that the, the, two, the two got into an argument. And, and Johnson was like a great stately galleon plowing his way through the waters. And Shakespeare is like a little skiff darting about the surface of the water, hitting Johnson from sides before Johnson had any idea where the next shot was coming from. <laughs> it's They were, and I, the best way I can put it is, friendly rivals. Mm. In the same way that for athletes, you're going to do better work if you're being challenged by somebody who's really good. Right. So Johnson, O. Oh, Johnson was the intellectual of the day, but a wonderful poet and totally ignored. Um, but he's the one when told uh, Master Shakespeare never blotted out a line. Johnson said, "What he had blotted a thousand. <laughs> yep. And then he talks about how in the Winter's Tale, there's a shipwreck at one point, and, and the survivors make it to the coast. And he says, there's no sea coast in Bohemia. It's set in Bohemia. <laughs> says, but for Shakespeare, that, that just didn't matter. <laughs> we need a sea coast. Ah, we put in a sea we'll coast. there, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so you know there was this... Not envy, I have friendly rivalry. Mm -hmm. Friendly rivalry. Well, one of the greatest elegies in the English language was written to Shakespeare by Johnson after Shakespeare's death. He died in 1616. And in 1623, the first folio came out, the collected edition, um, where they're close to half the plays we wouldn't have if his fellow Catholics in the company hadn't gathered them together and seen them into print. Mm -hmm. Johnson writes two poems, one at the very beginning and the, this is another one of those moments. Everybody says, we don't know what Shakespeare looked like. Oh, yes, we do, because Johnson speaks about it directly. This figure that thou here seest put, it was for gentle Shakespeare cut, wherein the graver had a strife with nature to outdo the life. Oh, could he have but have drawn his wit as well in brass as he hath hid his face, the print would then surpass all that ever was writ in brass. But since he cannot, reader, look, not on his picture, but his book. It's a lovely look. But it's great. Johnson saying that he nailed it. The, the, the engraver nailed it. That's what the man looked like. So we know. The elegy is lengthy. And uh, boy, it's a, an 80 line poem, but it's dandy. Mm. I'll just read the very end of it because all those people who say it was, you know, Queen and whatnot. Yeah. And if anybody, if anybody, wanted to expose the lie that this guy wasn't writing the plays, it would have been Johnson. He wouldn't mm -hmm. have put up with that nonsense for a minute. Instead, he writes this extraordinary tribute and calls him 
sweet swan of Avon. What a sight it were to see thee in our waters yet appear and make those flights upon the banks of Thames that so did take Eliza and our James. But stay, I see thee in the hemisphere advanced and made a constellation there. Shine forth, thou star of poets, and with rage or influence, chide or cheer the drooping stage, which since thy flight from hence hath mourned like night and despair's day, but for thy volume's light. It's just beautiful. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. But I would say even now, as they try to get rid of him, they're not going to be able to get rid of Shakespeare or Mozart or Michelangelo. The greatest glories of Western civilization are there. And our job, one of our jobs now, is like those monks who saw what was coming in the darkest of times and preserved what had to be preserved. And uh, without a doubt, Shakespeare is high up on the list. Mm. Wow. Well, amen to that. Goodness gracious. You're right. That's it, It's vital that we as Roman Catholics and just people living in the West that we preserve this because it's really the height of culture. We've seen what great things, having logos, having the word of God in yes. our culture has um has made us thrive. And so what what a what a great testimony there. So oh, thank you so much for sharing all of this, uh, Dr. White. Um, happy to do so. And, Absolutely. And as, I, as I've said, they I spent a life where they paid me to teach Shakespeare. Mm. I would have stood on, stood on street corners and done it for free. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the other thing, one last thing, and I insist mm -hmm. on this. You don't know poetry till you memorize it. Mm. Um, Johnson again said... Um, Memory is the first faculty to go. <laughs> so it's getting much, much harder for me. But I, I still try to memorize some poetry occasionally. Uh, and who knows? We may not have the books. All they have to do is erase the Internet when everything's on it. And they've gotten rid of the libraries. So get out there and memorize some Shakespeare. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, if you're uh, for our audience, uh, if you're interested uh, in in seeing more cultural content that do, does go into, um, of course, Western civilization, you can check out our paper. We have an uh, an article about Shakespeare this month, so do check that out. Link will be in the description. And thanks again for coming on, Doctor White. My oh, I need to do one other thing. Oh, of course, of course. <laughs> I need to do one other thing. I left out one other huge piece of evidence we need we need that let's hear it <laughs> the great orson wells and mm. uh if you don't know his falstaff film called chimes at midnight it's magnificent mm -hmm. truly uh for the first 10 minutes you got to put up with it because he ran out of money and he has to do all the voices and it's incoherent but then mm. it finally starts working but it is about the um, the death of excerpts from Richard II, both parts of Henry the Fourth, and mm -hmm. the Judy Dench does the death of false describes the death of false death. That alone is worth the 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 price of admission. <laughs> but in any case, the great Wells was a great filmmaker, and Hollywood hated him. Mm -hmm. Um, he would lean towards the uh, Oxford theory. One of the things he said, are you, are you telling me that King James was doing his own version of the Bible and didn't bring in the greatest poets of the age to write the Psalms? Mm. Well, of course he did, and we have the proof of it. Yeah. King James Version. Psalm 46, 
I'll read the beginning. I'll read the end. It's appropriate to wrap this up here. Hmm. Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed, and the mount, though the and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake. Forty-sixth word, Psalm forty-six. The word shake. I go to the end of the psalm now, skipping a little musical direction. Salah. He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. It's the 46th word from the end of the poem. Mm. We know the poet who did that version of Psalm 46 <laughs> because he signed his name to it. Oh, it's beautiful. <laughs> Goodness gracious. And he's, you see how intimately he's connected with every part of culture. He's in um he's he's in the translation of scripture. He's in our he's in the plays. Everybody knows who this man is. And it's something that we should just cherish as Roman Catholics that it's not just that he was a, a great writer, but I truly believe he was one of our own as well. Oh, so, he, oh no question about it. No question mm -hmm. about it. But it's because he did the work he was supposed to do. Yeah, and, absolutely. And his his vision at the end is one of glory. Mm -hmm. uh, it's all been worth it. He's been through it all and put it all down in the plays. And now, um, and my ending is despair, unless I be relieved by prayer. Mm. which pierces so that it assaults mercy itself and frees all faults. As you from crimes would pardon to be, let your indulgence set me free. Mm. And we all should remember him in our prayers as well. Remember the bard. We uh, he he need, we we like those prayers when we're we're gone. He's done so many, much for so many people, so we need to remember him as well. And thank you, uh, thank you so much as well, Doctor White, for um the work you've you've done. I know uh, you've been you've had a huge effect on my life. You've had a huge effect on so many people's lives. Many people have come through the, uh, to the faith uh, through what God has done in you. So thank you, thank you again for coming on the show, and thank you for all the work you've done. It's been a privilege. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, if, so from everyone here at Catholic Family News, we wish everybody uh, a great rest of your day. Do check out the paper, and God bless. <laughs>